Good afternoon sessions, track three. Appreciate you being here. Um, some of you have more old friends. I've been with the other all morning. Um, I did want to take a, a chance. Hopefully everyone got enough to eat or at least enough to absorb some alcohol tonight. Um, fantastic barbecue. I'd like to send a, just a huge thank you out to Gabe on for providing that to us. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Um, Shogo Cottrell um, is, uh, I almost said ex-Marine, that's not possible, right? So, so uh, U.S. Marine Corps, um, been in the industry about 25 years, uh, working with multinational companies, improving their security posture. Um, like a lot of us, started in his teenage years, um, getting interested in, and obviously has a lot of passion. Uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about current modeling, I believe, today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Shogo. I my teenage years, I guess I did. I don't know if I, is there like a statute of limitations so I can talk about what I did? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right there. Talk about stuff. <laughs> right there, that class. All right, maybe I won't. I just, I do, I do know that police showed up at my place and my dad talked to them. And, you know, then he came back and said, hey, I might take your computer away for a little bit. So that, that's as far as I'll go into that. <laughs> but I did have fun as a teen. And the cool thing is that, you know, technology and security is kind of turned on my passion, and I get to do that every day. And I, I get just want to see think about it. It's awesome to be able to do something you love. And um, thank you all for coming out. Um, I didn't think a topic as dry as threat modeling would draw out so many folks. So hopefully, it won't be quite that dry. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but glad to be back at B sides. I spoke a couple years ago on threat hunting, and so. Um, Try to think about the things I'm interested in and things I hear a lot about. So in my role, my job, I get to travel across the U.S. and talk to a lot of different security executives and technology leaders and managers and people down in the trenches. And it's really neat to see what challenges are going on across the kind of the threat landscape that people are doing. And I get a lot of questions, and some of the more common ones are, you know, hey, even from the most basic, immature security organizations to the, even the most mature with you know huge stock and hundreds of people it, it's still a challenge around hey how do i prioritize how do i know where to start what am i going to be working on what's important to me and then a lot of times how do we even represent that back to the business because you know we're all geeky but the business guys don't think in terms of geekiness right they want to know things in terms of how does it impact revenue and will grow business and what's how's it going to impact my margins and um, so as I started kind of thinking about that challenge, it's really around understanding risk, right? And business leaders have understood risk for hundreds of years as long as, you know, they've been in business. And, you know, we think about risk, um, but we think about it a little bit differently. And so how do we bridge that gap to see that we can communicate those two together? Uh, I, you know, I guess a little bit of background, I did start in my career in the Marines. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, today is a great sunny day and a spring day. Um, and usually you'll find yourself probably riding a horse with my wife uh, on a day like today rather than maybe doing something like this, but I do love this. I'm passionate about it. She works in security, so she's here as well. And uh, so we forked uh, gave a horse riding today to do uh, B sides, so but glad to be here. Um, that's Truman. Um, that's Fog. It's like, do you wear the Fog in a KU folks? I didn't go to KU, but she did. So that's, <laughs> and that's our baby over there. Um, we named him Thor. So. We got a little bit of Marvel fandom going on uh, in our house. And uh, another thing, I think that uh, I never outgrew Tonka trucks, so we recently bought some acreage, and I got some cool toys. This is not my toy, this is actually sitting out there. And um, I got just climbed in it in the weekend and took a picture of it. You know, I think our job is complicated. This thing has got like more knobs and switches that probably 747 doesn't see. I got in there and I'm like, I, I didn't even know where to even, you know, find the horn to honk at that, although I did, I, I scared her. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I've got a tractor now because we're building out, we're gonna have a horse with it sometime, and I bought it. a skid steer, and that thing's a lot of fun. And uh, I've already been yelled at for doing donuts in the grass, and I'm just gonna really grass with horses, so I can't do donuts anymore. Uh, but this gives me another idea for security talk. So this is a teeny little caterpillar, right? And this is a huge caterpillar, just you know, on a whim, because I'm that kind of guy. I tried my key in this, and it started right on up. <laughs> so I found out a couple things in owning, owning equipment now that when I got an extra key for my Kubota, for example, 
I was like, hey, I bet I'm gonna show my nice serial number and what model. He's like, hey, I need an extra key. All right, throw one across the counter. I'm like, do you care? He's like, no, one key fits them all. <laughs> all right, that's kind of scary. You know, it's been sitting in my acreage for like a year now without us out there every day. Um, and then I guess family, same thing for caterpillars. One key fits them all. So, anybody do that before me? Okay. They don't go very fast, so. <laughs> <laughs> mine's, mine's a two speed, but you're right. Like, I'm, I'm not going to go to the gas station and get gas in that. But uh, it kind of got me thinking about another security talk. Maybe I'll kind of think of something to do with. Uh, Set KC on that. All right, so uh, as part of my travel too, uh, you know, I like to take pictures of funny things. My wife doesn't think it's really funny, but you know, I um, come across stuff like this all the time. So does this ever, anybody ever see things like this? Is it kind of weird or not? I mean, all right, so uh, I, not that I'm gonna ha hammer on Delta, but I fly a lot of Delta and go through a lot of airports, so you see some Delta stuff up here, but um, blue screens of death and all over the place, right? I mean, so you think about how how much our world has changed in the last 20 years, right? So before, these things would be mechanical, right? These would flip the little number and they'd show the times of flights and stuff. Well, now it's electronic, but now there's a whole other set of risks and threats <coughs> that can happen to that. And so, you know, that's that's the boards where they show in Atlanta uh, where all the flight times are and everything. Um, I don't know, is that a big deal or not? I don't know, right? But it tells me some things. I think it tells me it runs on x86 it's, and Windows because it's got a blue screen. Um, no, this is an interesting one as well. What's that? It's also denial of service. Yeah, it could be denial of service, right? So you know, threats can, take, can manifest themselves in a number of different ways. And on top of that, threats have different levels of impact. And that's what we're going to talk about today is that you know how do we prioritize to understand the impact level to understand what the risk is right so you know this system you know maybe some passengers might be a little bit annoyed they can't find out what gate the flight is leading from so from an impact perspective it might be low um, but if this same thing happened like on a flight deck of an airplane that could be pretty bad right all of a sudden i have no screens i can't do anything what i'm going to do and in fact i think i read um, an article recently where um, that kind of happened. I think in flight, air, airplane took off. I thought it was United and American. They lost all the screens in the cockpit. They had to turn back and come around and land. Um, that's a big deal. And I think the reason the reason they made the news is that the guys kind of played it off as we have some sort of elect minor electrical malfunction, is what they told the passengers. So the reality, they lost everything in the cockpit and they're coming back in for landing. That's a big deal. Um, I guess you don't want to scare people and cause panic either. So maybe I would lie in that. Stupid. Um, and some other ones. Uh, again, this is this is a Windows thing. It says the computer is low on memory. That's another one that says you. Um, when, what does it say? Close program prevent information loss. The computer is low on memory. So, um, so that's a Levi Stadium. Uh, anybody been to Levi Stadium in San Francisco with the 49ers play? It's pretty new. It's like touted as one of the most uh, electronic kind of connected stadiums in the world. Right? When, you, when it first opened up. You have an app and you can literally order your food and come right to your chair. I mean, that was five or six years ago. Um, they run on Windows. Again, you know, as an attacker, I'd love to know what operating system was with it, and they just kind of gave it away. And you know, you wouldn't believe how many times I come through an airport and see like an error message and then like Windows XP's on the back end. I mean, like today, right? People still running the Windows XP. That's scary stuff. So let's talk a little bit about threat modeling. Um, before I do that, I always like to know who's in, my, in the room. So I heard, I heard some people were talking, uh, overheard them. So I, we have some students. How many students we got in here? Awesome. You guys all majoring in IT, tech, cyber, security? Yes. Okay, that's awesome. All right. Okay, how many of us work in uh, cyber security? Pretty much the rest. Anybody not in cyber security, just in kind of IT in general? Not that that's bad. That's cool. All right. Okay, cool. All right. So. I just thought we kind of understand what the audience is and um, where we're going to go with this. This is, by all means, not going to be a completely in-depth talk. So if you're looking for that, um, you know, maybe we can talk later offline. First, it started off as education for me. You know, hey, how do I talk to these, you know, these customers, companies? People are asking me questions about where to start, how do I understand risk? Um, so as I kind of learned about myself, I thought, hey, I could throw together a talk and maybe you guys can learn something too. So it's rather basic. Um, and I kind of kept it simple that way because I think um, I was talking to like Michael Lindsay back that if you start down threat modeling, I mean, um, 
you start on the back of the napkin, as he was talking about, right? Uh, but pretty quickly, you can be down rabbit holes and be very deep and very intricate and very complex. And uh, even when I started to do this talk, I found myself getting that way. And it's really hard to stay that way. And I'll talk about some of those complexities as we continue through this. But so threat modeling is just exa exactly that, right? It's a way to kind of think about how threats are postured in your organization, what kind of risks exist, or the likelihood of those risks and attacks happening against your environment, um, and what is the potential impact that that happening is going to take down my business um, for a day, an hour, is going to cost us money, um, and to understand how do I figure all that out, put together a big picture, and for the most part, the idea is that you come up with a list that says right here are my top assets, my top value items, and here are the risks that are against them, here's how they classify in terms of um, how likely and the impact that they are, and then you can say, all right, now I want to start from one to N and go start tackling the ones that are most risky, right? You can't, you can't protect everything, and I'm sure everybody in here realize that. Realize that. I won't spend $300 to protect $100, right? That makes no sense, but at some point there's this, this trade-off of understanding how much protection, how much it's going to cost me, and what's the value of the assets protected. I mean, none of us I mean, it's mandated now, but no one will probably drive down the road without having car insurance, right? So it's, it's there for a reason. I mean, obviously, we shop around for the best value, but the value also represents risk, right? Because that value is represented in terms of how much uh, protection you have um, against physical assets, against you know liability, coverage, et cetera. And different companies you know, have different price values for that. And there's also a risk matrix they do against you as a driver, right? So they evaluate hey, you know, the show has got speeding tickets, there's been a lot of accidents, my rates would go up, right? Because my risk to that company is the insurance has gone up. So it's kind of the same thing here. And so we got students, let's see. Oh, he said it was Marines, a Marine. So in the Marine Corps, we had to study. I mean, believe it or not, Marines have to read. Um, <laughs> so one of the things we had to uh, learn about was Sun Tzu and the art of war. And essentially the idea is that um, in threat modeling, you have to basically kind of think about attacks from a holistic perspective, and mostly from the attacker's point of view, right? So if the attacker wanted to attack your organization, what is he going to be after? What is he going to look at? Um, what's important to him? And then you can turn that down and say, all right, here's how he's looking at me. You know, maybe I've got a bank vault full of gold. He's going to want that, right? So how do I protect myself from theft of that gold? And that's kind of what Sun Tzu is saying there in not so many, probably more words than that. But that's my that's my Marine Corps term on how to simplify that to say, all right, that's what Sun Tzu is saying on there. Okay, so first some basics, because I think it's good to get kind of an understanding of the terms. So we've got how many people with CSSDs in here? All right. So we won't go by the CS, the ICC squared book, but you know, first, so I, I like interaction. Or maybe the students even. So tell me any what a threat is. Anybody got an idea of what a threat might be? Or how would you classify a threat or say what a threat is? Define that. Anything that can cause harm. Anything that can cause harm, yeah, exactly. So a circumstance that can cause an adverse impact is how um, I pulled that. I think I pulled this from the ISC squared. So if you're study, anybody studying for ACSSP? All right. This isn't completely, you know, tiered CSSP stuff, so test of all book stuff, but you know this. But I think this kind of relates to that. All right, what about impact? If you're thinking of threat modeling and modeling threats or attacks, how would you say what the definition for impact would be? The result of a threat action against an asset. Yeah, it's the result of a threat action, yeah. <coughs> so uh, the absence weakness of safeguard that makes a threat potentially likely to occur, that's a potential impact. And then an asset, you said asset, so I wish we could always do definitions but include the other, you know, words that we're going to define, but that's okay. Something you need to protect? Yeah, something you want to protect. Something important to you, right? It could be a process. It could be a business process, a business unit. It could be a system, application. It could be data. Things that you want to protect. Absolutely. All right. We're going to keep on going on. School's not out yet. So uh, what about a threat agent or threat actor? Sam, your point, opponent. What's that? Your opponent, who's trying to get to you? Yeah, it's the opponent. Someone is going to take advantage of uh, an exploit to uh, negatively impact you, right? He wanted to get to you, he wants to steal something, get something from you, right? Vulnerability? Everybody knows what vulnerability is. What's vulnerability? 
Weakness. The weakness, absolutely. The weakness or flaw. And then risk. We're talking about risk. We do a lot of talk about risk today. You want to take a crack at risk? What does it may cause to react <coughs> to you? Yeah, it's a potential for for a loss, right? It's what it may cost you, what's the potential impact? Um, my last one, wrapping it up, attack. What's an attack? Sorry for the sirens going outside. Hopefully not to one of my truck. Attack, right? That's the that's when a threat agent we talked about takes advantage of a vulnerability. They're attacking, they're going after something. An attack surface. Well, this won't come up too much today, but I thought I'd throw this in because I think this is yeah. important to think about, right? Where you're attack vulnerable. Surface. What's that? Where you're vulnerable. Where you're vulnerable, right? So it's the kind of all that exposure, where you're vulnerable, all the things combined together to take account to not only the vulnerabilities and the threats of the actors, but also the controls, right? So you can have all these, I can think of, I can probably, we could all probably think of, of a million and one threats against us today, right? But we have controls that help mitigate some of that, right? So as we have these controls, it minimizes that attack surface, is the way, of I, the way how I think of it, makes sense? All right. I love weather, by the way, so I pulled down a bunch of weather and just so you guys enjoy that in the background. And there are a bunch of threat modeling methodologies. They all have cool acronyms. I tried to come up with one for myself and my own one that I just made up. But I, we talked about horse last night, but um, I mean, it doesn't even have a C in it, so I can't even say threat in horse, but maybe force. I don't know. Anybody you heard any of these? Stride. Yeah, stride's out there. Um, stride. And Dread are kind of Microsoft centric ones. So if you're doing, if you've done anything with Microsoft or you software development, you're probably familiar with Stride or Dread life cycles. Primarily focused around software. Is that where you guys use it? Uh, it sounded from studies, and then it was developed by Microsoft. Yeah. Um, Pasta is another one. Like, it's a clinical acronym. I think they come up with the word first, and then you back, go and try to figure out how to do it. Trike and Octave, I've never really heard of those. I saw those in some of the research I was doing. Anybody use Trike or Octave or seen that before? I have. Yeah, in the back. Octave. Octave. Okay. Well, so there's some different methodologies out there. You know, um, they all have their advantages and their disadvantages, right? So I don't think this really models any of uh, these methodologies. It's kind of my take on kind of a way to start how to think about their modeling in your own organization or. So give me an R, all right? So today, threat modeling, our threat model, my threat model is gonna be about risk, right? With risk being the multiplication of likelihood and impact, okay? So if you, if I you know, think about it this way, on one side of the equation, I got risk, right? So that's what we're evaluating. If I increase likelihood and I increase impact, it means my risk goes up, right? So if I can make them both go down, my risk goes down. But here's some challenges with that, right? So think about, Likelihood. Can we influence likelihood? Yeah, we can influence likelihood pretty well, right? There's a lot of controls, mitigating things we can do to help reduce and improve uh, our threat posture and reduce the likelihood. How about impact? There's some things you can do, but not, I agree, not so much, right? And here's the other challenge. We all work in IT. Right, so how often, if you look at the last three or five years you've been working in technology, as your impact, your threat surface reduced, right? How many times have we gone and reduced systems, reduced our deployment models, reduced servers, reduced the footprint we have, reduced the amount of data we're collecting? It hardly ever happens, right? The challenge here is impact, generally, is always increasing. So if you think about this equation, right? If I want to minimize or not impact risk too much, and that thing is always increasing, where's our only influence? <coughs> it's in likelihood, right? So we only have a couple levers you can pull. So if, if one's always increasing, you're gonna have to yank it back on that likelihood pretty good. It's gonna happen. So let's talk about likelihood. Uh, likelihood is the probability of exploit. So it's the, the chances of a vulnerability being taken advantage of and exploited that would be bringing something bad happen to your environment. So I see, I see likelihood in, as a way of evaluating kind of the value of the targets, right? Um, and good place to start, uh, how many of us have DR, business continuity plans? Most, 
almost everybody, right? So they're kind of, the, when I talk to the security people and they want to understand risk, where do I start? Well, the good news is a lot of that work is already been done free, right? So if you've got a business continuity plan, that usually says somewhere in there, what are your high value assets? And so I would start there, right? If, if you have a number one system that is, hey, this is most critical to our business, why not start there from a risk a threat perspective? Because you know that's going to probably carry the, the biggest impact, right? So we know from a risk perspective, it's going to be pretty big too. So how do we put together controls to reduce that likelihood to make that um, not as risky if something were to be exploited there? Internal versus external. So again, think about likelihood. Um, <coughs> these days, it's a little bit different, but I still I still think that there's a difference between internal uh, threats to internal targets versus threats to external targets. Does everybody kind of agree with that? Right, I mean, it, yeah, I, I mean, I think if uh, an attacker really wanted to get that past your controls that protect the exterior of your organization, like your firewalls, whatever, they can do that, right? And they demonstrate time and time and time and time, and time again, right? But the easier target is obviously, kind of, I think, the one external, right? Um, it's already on the outside, probably has fewer controls around it. There's not a lot of things we can do. In our external websites, we want the public to see that. So we can't lock it down really a lot. Otherwise, they can't see it, right? So um, the risk, you know, the attack surface there is a little higher. I like evaluating the skill level needed by an attacker. Uh, why is that important? Because attackers come in different flavors, different capabilities, right? And when we look at attackers, their skill level, we've got guys out there doing a ton of research, finding the zero days. We know zero days are out there. We don't know how many because a lot of them hold those close hold, right? But those are probably the most highest, you know, on the threshold of risk that I can think of from an attack perspective, right? We have other ones that are 10-year-old Windows vulnerabilities that somehow we still can't seem to get patched, right? And that there are most exploit uh, scripts already written for them, and so a, a skill level for an attacker to run a most exploit script is probably pretty pretty low. But those are considerations as well in terms of likelihood being taken. I think I, I covered that already, but no and exploits versus can uh, scripts to uh, vulner, uh, to exploit those vulnerabilities. Those are things we think about and should be concerned with. So next, impact. So we talk about impact. That impact is always increasing. Right? We know that our, we're deploying to the cloud. We're having, always having more data. The amount of data we collect is growing. The amount of systems we use is growing. It's increasing more complexity. So it's, this is a challenge for us when we're doing risk analysis. Um, what's always most, what is the most important for us? Uh, what, are, what are those assets that really are high value? So something's gonna kind of cross between both risk, uh, likelihood and impact from a risk perspective. The value of the system, the, the scope, the breadth of the system, how, how complex it is, all manage to play a role in the, the definition of both in some aspects. Financial impact. So again, going back to probably your business continuity or disaster recovery plan, if you have one, hopefully that talks about business impact. So that the search system or business process is not able to work for a certain period of time. There's cost involved in that, right? And that cost ratchets it up over time, which eventually gets to the point where um, that makes some hard decisions about what we're going to do if that cost um, exceeds the capability for us to continue to run business. Availability can be impacted, just like those blue screens of death, right? Um, the, we are concerned, always concerned about the availability of our business processes, availability of our systems, and impact certainly it plays a huge role there. Um, damage potential, again, same thing. Uh, the scope and scale of impact, and it, that, gets, that gets back to kind of the scope and complexity of everything that we do. And, um, and I'm going to get to this in a couple slides, but there are kind of a couple ways that I started thinking about threat modeling, and you can do, and there's, number, there's probably an, an infinite number of ways, but I really think of it in terms of kind of two venues, right? One is looking at it from an asset perspective. And I like to think of that, because you know, when I was uh, leading security organizations and talking to things like boards of directors, they want to know things in terms of business impact, right? So when I think of assets, I think of business alignment. So how, how am I affecting the bottom line of the business in terms of the controls I'm putting into place, the cost of those controls, the protection mechanism, and what's protecting. The other way to look at it is, I think, from a threat perspective, right? What kind of threats can I enumerate through and think of 
that could pose a risk to my organization, and then I can apply those threats against an asset, a system, right? And say, all right, hey, you know, threat A may have low likelihood, low impact, meaning I'm not going to worry about as much. Threat B could be high impact, moderate um, likelihood, and so maybe that's something I'm going to look at and implement some more controls around because that risk got higher than the threshold that I'm uh, able to want, or the thresh, likelihood threshold that I want in my organization. Reporting requirements. The big one coming up these days, right? So there are more and more regulations that are happening in the world today. The GDPR rolled out this last you know, year, and you know, all the states, individual states, the federal government. So you know, if you are breached, you have an issue um, with data that's got uh, into the wrong hands, the reporting requirements, I think, have to play in that as well, right? So when you look at <coughs> impact, it's certainly something you don't want to ignore because um, if you do have a breach, obviously there are all sorts of concerns about how much that costs you, but that cost also includes reporting requirements. So think about that when you're thinking through impact. And um, I, I like to think of things in terms of qualitative as opposed to quantitative. It makes it a little bit, in my mind, easier to model. And so this is kind of what a model would look like if you're going to put together risk and impact and scale, or a likelihood and impact and scale. So you got likelihood from uh, top to bottom, almost certain, down to rare. You guys do that in the back? I know I did get a huge screen, so you can't hire. And across impact, insignificant, severe. And then where they, in, where they intersect, obviously, that's your risk. And anything that's probably rare, insignificant, impact, that's like low, ignore that. That's never gonna happen. I don't care, even if it did happen, the impact's so negligible, it's not gonna interrupt anything, not gonna matter. Now, so how do you determine the risks scoring within that? Well, that's up to you, right? So really it's up to kind of the, the, the risk appetite of the organization that you're in, right? Some organizations are highly risky. They're okay with taking on risk, and they're okay with taking on risk that's above average. So maybe in that case, you might only have a couple of extreme risks on that scenario, because otherwise, then, other than that, they're okay with it. They're right at risk, right? There are other organizations that are probably have a very low threshold of risk, and you probably see more extreme and more high, and probably fewer low and moderate. So that's where you know I kind of that's why I think qualitative as opposed to quantitative can help, right? So you can adjust this to match what your organization understands and what they're interested in, and how they want to tackle the resolution of risk. All right, so where do we start? Risk tolerance, we talked about that, the, you know, the ability of the organization or where they stand in terms of wanting risk and how it impacts. Um, we've got assets. So I talked about, they're really, I think of it in two ways of how to think about understanding risk. You can evaluate assets, top to bottom, most highly uh, profitable or most important asset and work your way down. And then again, let me enumerate all the threats that can happen to that. Uh, there's another way of doing it, you can take threats or attacks, come up with a whole list of attacks or threats that can uh, exist against your organization or you can think of, and then you enumerate those against your assets. So here's where it gets really complex is that when I always see complexity, it happens when there's a many-to-many -many intersection, right? I've got a ton of assets, I've got a ton of threats. All of these threats, one to whatever I can think of, can always can hit every single one of my assets, right? So, so first I was kind of leaning towards really doing from an asset perspective, because I think this gets your best business line. If you go talk to your business leaders, your board of directors about risks and what risks you should be concerned with, they're gonna wanna know in terms of business context, right? If we can go back and talk to engineers, the IT guys, they're probably gonna care more about, and your security team probably gonna care more about security alignment, right? I wanna know about the threats and how those threats can uh, impact my organization, my assets. So my thinking kind of swayed back and forth on this talk. So if, if I'm kind of curious what you all think. What would be most important to you? How many people think that would be better to enumerate and evaluate by assets first? Yeah, I think that's kind of where I was at first. And what about the other two threats? There's a handful of threats. I think ah. you have to model it depending on who your audience is. 
And like, kind of like you said, the business it was more about yeah. the assets to that because like our organization wants everything broken up by applications. So like right. this application is this business unit and we need to do a threat analysis for them and we kind of silo it and so that they can have, they can yeah. know where to, where to focus. And I, I think that's kind of where I ended up laying. I kind of went one direction to the other and I kind of ended back in doing it by assets, by business alignment. Because I think as part of this uh, exercise when you do threat modeling, you're gonna have to come up with a list of threats. And the threats are probably gonna be the same across the board uh, against any asset you can think of. What changes is the likelihood and the impact, okay? And I've got a slide up, we'll talk about that, right? So we can, we can influence that. So a denial of service attack, externally, the likelihood and impact of that could be very different from a denial of service attack coming from the outside against an inside asset that's protected by a couple levels of firewalls, labs, et cetera, right? So it's the same attack, but the impact against an asset can differ based on that asset and the controls that are in place behind it. So uh, that's where I kind of came back and I thought, you know what, thinking from an asset perspective, most of the hands raised were here, it's probably the best way to kind of tackle that. Um, you, then you, can, you still have to create a kind of a threat matrix or threat tree or threat list, however you want to come up with that. You still have to evaluate those against all those assets. Um, but in my mind, I think that's probably the best way to go because eventually we're going to have to take it to the business, right? The business makes the decision, right? They, the CEO, the board of directors, they're the one who are ultimately responsible and accountable for um, understanding how much risk they're going to take, how much money they're going to spend to reduce risk. And there's always risk, no matter what it is, whether it's from a technology or security or even a business perspective, risk of someone across the street going in business and competing against us, right? So uh, they're always concerned about that and they're always trying to manage that kind of teeter-totter of risk to make sure that, hey, we're doing it the right way. We put enough money into it so that, you know, it's not gonna teeter-totter on us the other way and we're gonna send us out of business, but yet I haven't spent so much money that that's gonna send me out of business the other way because now I'm totally in debt and I've paid too much for the protection mechanisms to protect my assets. So it helps us prioritize, and there's always gonna be a lot of brainstorming in place, right? So get together with teams, get together with development, get together with the business, right? And say, hey, let's start thinking about the threats that exist to our environment. And how would we respond to those threats, what controls we have in place already, and then further on, if it ends up in a very risky space, can we put more controls on that to help bring down that risk? And so, again, putting you know, Sun Tzu to work, think about it from an attacker's perspective. This is like the magic quadrant of attackers, right? So, at the bottom you have effort and risk from most difficult to easy. Um, from an effort risk from an attack somebody, and then of course the, the payout. There's some sort of payout when I attack. I want something out of it, right? So kind of that mark, the magic quadrant of the easiest and highest payout ends up being that far side with ad fraud. Um, you kind of end up with maybe intellectual property threat or extortion out there. And then of course here's stuff that's kind of harder to do to some extent, but you get really little payout. I mean, I could go get credit cards all day long, but in the end, I can finally charge a couple of uh, fraudulent charges on it before I have to go get another credit card, right? Easy to do, but the payout's pretty minimal. So that's one way, you know, putting that attacker hat. So we gotta start thinking about threats, we gotta put that hat on. Another thing, uh, we can use other tools, right? So, I know you guys can't see this in the back, but it was designed to be seen. This is the minor attack framework. Everybody heard of the minor attack framework, right? Great, another great place, reference area, to understand and find out about uh, threats and attacks, how those attacks are carried out, and whether or not they're applicable to your organization. So how do we discover threats? Well, the goal of discovering threats is to find applicable threats, and then hopefully the mitigating controls that can minimize those threats against being exploited in your organization. So there are a bunch of public threat libraries. I'm sure most of us have seen these, right? MITRE has one with the KPEC. The SANS Top 25 I love. I love the OWASP Top 10. Um, there's a threat catalog that the Open Security Architecture Alliance has, and then Brainstorm. Like commercial tools as well, that some of them take to effect some of the public threat libraries and come with some of their own. Um, Threatmodeler.com, great uh, domain for, a, uh, if you're looking for a threat model, that comes up like number one in the Google search, right? But they actually do have some pretty good tools, but you know, they're, they're for pay, um, and you, you know, maybe you get some more value out of that. Um, Microsoft, some people have said that they use Microsoft from here, so Microsoft has a whole toolkit around threat modeling. Designed primarily around software 
development. But hey, I, I think that's a great place to do threat modeling, right? Because um, in, in today's world, every, everything runs on software. And um, even think, I have to even think about the 737 Max scenario that they've got going on right now, right? Is that you know we can deploy, we can send hardware out tomorrow, right? We don't even have to really test it thoroughly because we know we can fix issues through software patches, right? So you can overcome even hardware problems through potential future software fixes. Hubble Space Telescope is another example. Everybody when that went up, had a bad mirror. So physically the mirror was wrong, right? And, but we can't bring it back to Earth, put another mirror in it, send it back up to space. So how do they fix it? They fix it through software. So we we fixed a huge big spherical mirror that was, you know, probably within you know 9.999999 whatever percent perfect, the exception that we missed the requirement. So uh, but we can think, fix things through software, so software is important and critical, and I would love to hear the organizations doing threat modeling against their software as part of their software methodology, right? So what a great place to start thinking about attacks. If I'm writing a line of code, and I can think about eight, did I just write something that would be susceptible to attack when it gets deployed in production? At, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think that happened. Um, so that, this is great. So if you guys are using threat modeling in your software organization, awesome. Any software developers in here? Oh, you guys doing for modeling as part of something? Yeah, all the time. What were you, uh, is that fairly new? For us it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say fairly new in the last few years, right? Yeah, it's been the same thing in back. Yeah, but like 10 years ago, we write software 10 years ago? Probably. Yeah. Okay. And were you doing for modeling then? Um, yeah, we started, but it, and it was just like the matrix, basically, is what we would do. Yeah. Um, we call it a hazard analysis. Hazard yeah. analysis, okay, yeah. But for the most part, most, I mean, I think software development is more so concerned about meeting business requirements, right? I got a set of requirements. I'm going to plug into that to make sure I meet those requirements. The requirements don't mention anything about making sure I'm protected from a price cross site scripting flaw. Right? I didn't care about that because that wasn't a requirement, right? But, but things are changing. That's great. Great to hear. Uh, so, some ways to brainstorm. I picked up some of these um, at RSA a few years ago. I just thought, hey, cool. It's a, a, a deck of cards. And then I went through it and I'm like, wait a minute, there's like 72 cards here. That's not a deck of cards. Well, <laughs> later on, I figured I was like, oh, hey, wait, this is a tool for threat modeling. And so they actually, it's open source. You can go to Microsoft and find these cards that call the Elevation Privilege Cards. It's kind of a game you can use to help jumpstart brainstorming on threat modeling. So the cards are related to risk. They are, uh, remember the Stride methodology? It's spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, and denial of service, elevation privilege. And so there's cards from one to ace, and they come up with a scenario. You just kind of brainstorm through that scenario and say, all right, hey, if I was worried about tampering in this particular scenario, how could that affect my system, the software I'm working on, my business process, whatever it is. And then it just kind of helps jumpstart, gamify the process of brainstorming. And there's a whole bunch of them in there. And I think OWASP has cards too. Have you seen the OWASP cards? I haven't really got my hands on the deck of those, but OAuth has a similar set of cards for um, web applications locally. All right, so I said, you know, using simple tools, I, I love spreadsheets. Uh, I wasn't going to put a spreadsheet file on board because I thought it might be hard to see on a, on a uh, screen, uh, even a projector screen, so I'm glad I didn't because on this smaller screen, it might be even tougher to see, but this is kind of an example of it. I kind of broke it up into two parts because I didn't, in the spreadsheet, it could be probably a huge number of columns, and so first I put up, I'm going to put up and show kind of how you evaluate, or how I, I was thinking of evaluating threats and attacks, right? So like I said, you can think of it in two ways, assets and threats. We've got to enumerate threats anyways, so let's talk about threats. So we can come up with a whole list of attacks, you know, one to N, and I gave some examples up here, and then I think there are um, attributes about those attacks in your environment that make a difference on how those attacks impact and the likelihood of those attacks having uh, a negative result against your organization, right? So uh, external, internal, the skill level, again, I said, you know, plays a factor there, right? So if, a, if it requires low skill and there's a can attack for it, you know, from my perspective, I think the likelihood goes up significantly, right? Because then all of a sudden, anybody in the world can download and exploit and start hitting my website to try to find a vulnerability pretty easy to do. And the countermeasures, so the countermeasures kind of decrement, right, so they reduce the potential impact. So if I've got a countermeasure in place, does it help me worry about this less? 
well, hopefully it does. But I think there's some examples where you can have a lot of countermeasures and the effectiveness probably doesn't get changed too much. And I think of fishing, right? So how many people have been fished in their lives, right? Everybody has, right? Anybody want to raise your hand saying they fell for the bait? <laughs> no one wants to do that. I have before, right? So you know, don't, you can have training, you got to stay gateway, you can do endpoint protection, but fishing for some reason still seems to work. Because every card does all those things, right? And you guys still see successful fishing and taxing organizations? Absolutely, right? So the likelihood of success, even though you have all those controls in place, doesn't get changed all that much. But that's okay, right? So we just, that's just part of the risk <coughs> modeling, right? This is threat modeling. So we just got to think about around that, how else can we mitigate, detect, analyze, and then react to a threat like that happening? Zero days, in my example, I think, you know, at an external website, on a zero day, there's probably, we don't know any exploits now, right, but as soon as that zero day comes out, it's probably gonna come along with the exploit with it, right? So, no countermeasures, and my guess is with zero day exploit, it's probably gonna be almost certain to happen, right? So, that's always gotta be concerned about that, but how do you protect yourself from zero day? There's not very much, there's not many things you can do, right? Stay without the patching, right? That's one way of doing it, but, a zero day really means is that there's a, an exploit that's not been reported back to the vendor. It's not patched. So what do we do? Yeah. You <laughs> shrug your shoulders, right? Hope for the best. <clears throat> and so we put it all together, right? So put it all together, it says that, hey, now we talk about assets. So we now, now we're going to enumerate the threats against the assets. This is a pretty simplistic view. I would probably put this, I mean, my my view had it on one spreadsheet, I think on, on, on one line. I broke it into two just for simplicity of kind of breaking out the attack evaluation from the impact and in, uh, likelihood evaluation against the risk. So again, we've got the asset now, we're going to tie and enumerate the attacks against it with the likelihood that we came up with in the, in the previous slide, right? So probably the same line or wherever you want to do it. And then um, against that model they had where um, impact and likelihood intersect. So if I had a uh, unlikely, moderate, uh, or major impact, I have a moderate risk. Depending on your organization, do you care about moderate risks or not? Right? Do you care about the extreme? I would say probably most organizations get an impact where it's extreme, where you don't have mitigating controls in place and it's like highly, highly risky. You would certainly probably start thinking about how do we protect that and put some controls in mitigating circumstances to make sure we reduce that risk. And so again, phishing, accounts payable, that's going to be likely because we think that probably no matter how much training we do, there's always a way of doing it. You know, I think of a phishing campaign I ran once where it's like April 14th, and I mean, it looked like it came from the IRS, and, and a lot of people were bad because <laughs> they fell for that. <laughs> but, that this, but that's the scenario, that's what's going to happen, right? So, in fact, the major risk ends up being high. And then, even those countermeasures, like I said, are minimized. So, how do we protect that? There's other things we can do, you know, web content filtering, et cetera. You know, look at the domain generated algorithms. You know, things that we can do to detect when someone actually falls for a phishing attack to minimize the effect of that particular exploit. So, final thoughts. So, this is a wrap. This, in my mind, was rather simplistic. So, hopefully, and, I, and hopefully, everybody can see where you can really start getting complex on this, right? Because if you have a, an infinite number of attacks and a pretty big number of, of assets, you got to map those all together um, where that evaluation can get pretty hairy pretty quick, right? And so I try to keep it simplistic because it's a good place to start. So if you're not even doing it today, why not look at it from that perspective, right? That's, that's one thing to do. Um, it's a good place to start. It doesn't have to be difficult. But most importantly, it gives us kind of clarity, right? It helps us prioritize. It helps us to see clearly you know, what are our most risky areas that we're, that we're concerned about, what are our most important assets that we need to protect, do we have protection mechanism behind those? Are they adequate? Do we have the right staffing, do we have the right technology? And in my mind, I always think about the problem being kind of threefold, right? It's people process technology. So I can deploy technology, but if it's not deployed right, it's not gonna work. Um, I've got a great example, right? I put in my first sim, and um, things were going right. We were kind of detecting some stuff. Like day two, everybody's like, hey, it's not really working like we thought it would. Uh, we should be getting a lot more stuff from our intrusion detection sensors. Well, the intrusion detection sensors have been in place for like four years. They've been misconfigured from like day one. So 
So for four years, the IDSs were doing nothing. Nothing for us, right? It took the SIM to discover that, right? So this configuration is like that happened, right? So it was not a proper application of people processing technology. We had a gap. We thought we had protection. We had, thought we had a countermeasure in place, and we didn't. Else with due diligence, right? So at least at some point, if something bad does happen, we can say, we did a risk analysis. You know, is it going to cover your ass or not? I don't know. But, you know, at least at some point you can say, we did it. And then we give you at least some mechanism to say, hey, we missed something. Maybe there's a gap in our threat modeling, a gap in our risk assessment, or maybe even a gap in our risk tolerance organization. Maybe the risk, the organization said, you know what? We're okay with that risk. Forge it ahead. All right, we got burned on that. Hey, let's look at that risk tolerance. We said we're okay with that. This happened. We're not happy now. What are we going to change in our risk tolerance to make sure that doesn't happen again? And you can use this more robustly, right? So we talked about people using it in their software lifecycle model. Great, that's awesome. Um, you can use it for security sessions, appropriate team testing, risk assessments. A lot of applicability there. You know, the bottom line is use it, right? I think um, everybody watched Toy Story with Winnie. Like, you know, you don't have a movie, buddy, get one. Well, here's, here's your threat modeling, right? If you, don't, are, if you aren't using threat modeling, do it. Get one. Get a threat modeler. Um, that's kind of my view on that. Uh, and that's pretty much all I had, other than maybe a couple more slides of blue screens. But, um. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Are there, are there any professional threat models in this room? Are, are there? You probably should be up there doing that. You are? We have the cards. Oh, OK. We have the cards? I have the cards. You use them? Yep, we use them. Yeah, they're good. Aren't they? They're cool. Yeah, in class, yeah, yeah. class, yeah, absolutely. Well, any questions? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else in here use a commercial threat modeling tool? And if so, what tool? Do we use any commercial tools out there? We're not necessarily using it yet, but we're looking at one called the Amaya, the Amaya Security. And it's different, though. This is more of a qualitative analysis. This is more of a, the one we're looking at is more quantitative. Okay. So it's a very different approach. Um, and I think you can argue either side of the fence as which one's more effective. We're just trying to use something a little different than qualitative. Let's see, let's see what we get with quantitative. So quantitative, there's, there's really there's nothing. You're gonna get solid results if you do an all-out quantitative analysis. However, I think the the, the problem is that the amount of data and, and definitions you gotta do up front to put that quantitative value on each of these different steps. Right? Agreed. This is kind of easy, right? Because I say, hey, I am medium low. Anybody, everybody can do that, right? First, second, third gear. I am medium low, I am medium low, intersect, care, don't care. But then again, someone, you know, I, you know, I, I worked in an organization where we had a CFO, and the COO was the former CFO. They walked around these big, huge ass calculators. I mean, like the ones like this big. <laughs> the only thing they're missing was the paper roll on it, right? But every time I went to a meeting, you know, and I, I'm putting up numbers in front of them, the first thing to do, like double checking my math, right? So, <laughs> quantitative can burn you, <laughs> but you guys should just do all your homework up front. But yeah, but if but it, if, it, if it's there, and it's put in. You can't argue against it. Qualitative, you know, it's it's kind of be done, right? So how'd you come up with that? Why'd you say medium for that? Medium could be here to here. Right? Any other questions? So I thought this was interesting. This is uh, it, it, this is the Atlanta airport. They got these big cloud and then it's a winter, winter, Internet Explorer window over over on what was supposed to be an ad. But, um, and it was, it was like that for like two days, and I flew there, went somewhere, and I flew back, and it was still there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is another great one. I don't remember where that was at, but a huge you know, video display. It's like some of Mido's error. Got one more. And I, and I, don't like, and I said I wasn't going to pick all on Delta. So uh, anybody here for AMC? You work at AMC? I never worked there, but I oh, I mean, you're working at AMC because they're in town. So this is one of their uh, kiosks. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what software they're running? They're yeah. and, uh, you can go find Brittany later. She's here. CIO, so I'm, I'm telling you, that you, you yeah. Know, yeah. I, you know, I just take a picture. I think it, in my mind, I think it's funny, right? But I'm I'm naturally inquisitive. So I also, you know, interesting to know. Hey, so that thing's a hardened box. It's got a card reader on it. It's run a Windows. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> right? And then, you know, the, the Delta kiosk, an IP address conflict, so <laughs> kind of bad. 
you know, what else they put on the network with the same IP. But do you really expect the AMC box to be more secure than, say, an ATM that's been running Windows 98 since they came out? <laughs> yeah. Well, ATMs are running yeah. more, yeah. more XP, uh. more, you know, put in your particular flavor, but do you expect that to have more security than an ATM? <laughs> No, you know, and there, you know, and there's like I said, there's a number of factors to value at risk. You know, some things you can do like targeting, right? I mean, I think a lot of really good technical engineers, like the guys that are in here, you could probably take a Windows 98 box and harden that, right? Stop processes from running, etc. And you probably have a pretty, pretty solid OS, even though it's not been used and out of support, not patched for like decades, right? Rework the registry from the ground up. <laughs> yeah, but people do it. So does that, what does that mean for riskiness? So if I'm running Windows 98, should you run away from that being, being scared? It, it depends, again, and the same thing is that evaluation of risk, right? I can put together countermeasures in place to protect something, so it may be highly risky to begin with, but by the time I start applying all these protection mechanisms, it's not as risky as I thought. So all, all you have to do is unplug it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone asked me once, how would you build the like most secure network? And I thought, hmm, now I would probably put a computer and a router and some cabling or maybe a switch and that would keep it powered off and no access to it. <laughs> That's the most secure computer network. But it does absolutely nothing for you, right? So there's that trade-off in security, right? With, you know, what's easy and easy to use and meaningful versus secure. But I think ratchet security pretty high, but that, means, that probably means people aren't going to get a lot of stuff done. Yeah. So the only thing that I would say, like to Shogo's point, to your point, uh, is that like some of those uh, tables that you had up there about you know what is the likelihood, what is the threat, what you're doing to mitigate it. Yeah. Like if you're working in an organization where you know, depending on maturity, if people aren't thinking about that kind of stuff, those. Those um, tables and spreadsheets and stuff, there's tons of pre-built ones, yeah. like online. And you can go and like start evaluating what your company is doing and you know, see any fill a need. That's how sometimes security positions get started in organizations. Yeah, yeah. CIS, um, MITRE, they've got some great frameworks and great tools, open source, spreadsheets, great places to start, right? So you can be thinking, oh my gosh, how can I even think about, there's gotta be a million different threats and attacks against me. Well, they've got all those enumerated out, right? So start there. Right? And then marry that up with the work like someone else did on your business continuity work. So someone sat up there and said, hey, this is most important, my business. Put those two together, at least you've got a place to start. For sure. So thank you for sharing yeah, your thank knowledge. Thank you.